The mountain country along the borders of Nepal and Tibet is one of the least known regions of the inhabited world. This is why Christoph Heimendorf, who's an anthropologist, wanted to explore it. He and his wife, Betty, flew from Kathmandu to Pokhara. But that was their last contact with powered transport for over eight months. The Heimendorfs were making for Tukshi, an important trading center on the caravan route between Nepal and Tibet. In these parts, you measure journeys in days, weeks, even years, not in miles. The tracks used by the traders with their caravans of pack animals, their sheep and their goats, follow the rivers. Such bridges as do exist are often no more than a couple of logs which get swept away when the monsoon rains flood the rivers, or else crazy affairs of rope and bamboo. Getting to Tukshe wasn't very difficult. The problem that concerned the Heimendorfs as they neared the village was how they were going to get beyond the Himalayas and into the isolated region they wanted to explore. They didn't even know what it was called in the local dialect. Tukshi lies in the valley of the Kali Gandaki, a river which cut through the Himalayas from north to south, providing one of the few throughways from Nepal to the Tibetan border. It separates the giant peaks of Dalagiri and Annapurna, both over 26,000 feet. Somewhere behind them, there's the Heimendorf's objective. Tukshe, when the Heimendorf's arrived, was busy with the first of the two harvests of the year, and the village street was full of men and women carrying bundles of barley in from the fields. The next stage of their journey would certainly take time to organize. So the Heimendorfs installed themselves in a house in the village, flat roofed like all the others, with a ladder leading up from the courtyard below. On similar roofs all round, their neighbors were threshing and singing as they worked, beating the grain with primitive flails made of wood and bamboo. The Takalis, whose homeland this is, are prosperous merchants, as well as cultivators, trading their grain for salt from Tibet, which later will fetch a good price in the valleys lower down. The salt is measured out by a man who chants all the time to make sure that he doesn't forget how many measures he's filled. Five measures of salt for six of barley was the current rate of exchange in Tukshi. Trade with Tibet has exerted considerable influence on Chakali culture, and Buddhism has for long been the dominant religion. To gain merit, rich men arrange for the scriptures to be read aloud in their houses by groups of lamas, each reading from a different book. The point of a recitation of this kind is that as many books as possible should be read, and the Lama's assistants are kept busy fetching heavy prayer books from the temple library and carrying them back again. Side by side with Buddhism, an older tribal religion survives, and animal sacrifices continue to be performed in honor of the local deities of field and forest. There are no temples for these nature deities, but on specific days, the men of a Takali village gather in the nearby forest to attend the sacrifice and afterwards to feast on the flesh of the sacrificial animal. Its body is handed over to the cooks to be skinned and turned into stew just as soon as its head's been chopped off. The heads are put on the altar as an offering to the deity, and the priest, who is always a young boy, 
decorates the surrounding bushes with strips of red and white cloth. Ostensibly, this is still a religious occasion, but over the centuries, the rites originally intended to propitiate the local gods appear to have developed into primarily social affairs, with the feast rather than the sacrifice as the focal point. Rice, which is costly since it can't be grown at these high altitudes and has to be brought up on pack ponies, is kept for just such special occasions as this. The boy priest, who because he must be a virgin, is seldom more than 10 or 11 years old, eats separately. He's always chosen from one of the priestly families, but even so, neither he nor any of the men attending the ceremony give the impression of great religious fervor. Quite different is the Takali's attitude to Buddhism. Buddhist temples thrive on the contributions of a pious laity. Here, a new statue is being carried to the temple near Tukshi, where it will take its place among numerous other large and small images already installed there. Nuns in pointed red hats take part in the procession. The sound is phenomenal and increases in volume as the procession goes into the temple and drums and cymbals are beaten to attract the attention of the deities who might otherwise overlook the rites to be performed in their honor. Young monks garland all the statues with sweet-smelling flowers. Incense is burnt and offerings of food and flowers are placed on the altar. Buddhism is a highly sophisticated religion with a strong emotional as well as an intellectual appeal. Tradition and ritual are maintained by well-organized communities of monks and nuns, among them Tibetans who took refuge in Nepal when they were turned out of their own monasteries by the communists. When the Heimendorfs left Tukshi, they went north along the valley of the Kali Gandaki towards Marfa. They'd been six weeks gathering information, and it was already early June, but at least they now knew a little more about their objective. It was called Dolpo, they'd been told, and they'd been encouraged to find that some of the Takali traders had contacts among the people there. Less encouraging was the news that Dolpo was snowbound for most of the year and only accessible at all during the short Himalayan summer. On the hillside above Marfa, they met villagers returning from the forest with heavy loads of firewood. Nearby supplies have long ago been exhausted, so the people of Marfa make an annual trip to the distant forests and return with enough fuel to last out the year. It's a matter of pride for a Takali to have some of last year's wood still stored on his roof when the new supply is brought down to the village. This is also the time of year when the men of Marfa hold a competition in bowmanship. The competitors choose their arrows from a common pool and divide into two teams which compete against each other. The target is an upright board. Any hit on the board counts as a point for the team. As soon as all the members of one team have expended their arrows, they retrieve them, a fair number of them from well outside the target area. Then the team's change ends and the members of the second team see what they can do. It costs five shillings to take part in the competition, and unless someone scores the bullseye, this money is shared by the winning team. When a man does hit the bull, 
It counts as a personal win, and he's entitled to keep the whole of the prize money himself, which, as everyone else has to pay him five shillings, makes him, even if only temporarily, quite a rich man. There are other rewards too for the winner, and when he's collected his prize money, the women offer him a libation of rice beer, or a local spirit called rakshi. Early on the morning after the competition, the Heimendorfs left Marfa with a caravan of yaks and joppers. The joppers are crossbreeds, part yak and part oxen, and are more docile than the yaks. Both animals are used to high altitudes and can carry heavier loads than pack ponies, but even so, about 80 pounds was as much as they could manage. River crossings caused frustrating delays. Everything had to be unloaded and then reloaded on the other side. Even when there were bridges, they were far too dangerous for loaded pack animals. And not too safe for humans either. Yaks can't be persuaded to cross bridges at all. They much prefer to swim. But joppers can sometimes be led across. The climb up from the rivers was very often almost perpendicular, and as the country grew wilder, there was less and less chance of getting help if things went wrong. Fortunately, the yak drivers knew the route. They'd been up to the fringe of the Dolpo area the year before. June, they said, was certainly the best month to attempt the journey, but even so, it was full of hazards. In the early stages, it was the rivers that caused most trouble. There were raging torrents across which the animals had to be hauled on the end of a rope. A yak weighs all of half a ton, and the Heimendorf's slim nylon rope remained a source of wonderment to the drivers, even after its efficiency had been proved again and again. There was one bridge that consisted only of loose stone slabs laid across a couple of crooked, rickety poles. No pack animal could possibly cross it. In conditions such as these, it was sometimes two hours or more before the whole party and all the baggage had been safely transferred from one bank to the other. With supplies and equipment for nine people, restricted to bare essentials by the amount the pack animals could carry, the loss of even one load would have been extremely serious. After eight days of crossing rivers, of climbing up and going down, never once on the level, the Heimendorfs came to a region of high plateau and broad upland valleys. They were now well over 15,000 feet, and vegetation was reduced to grass and a few rock plants. Fuel was scarce and rations reduced to a little rice, roasted barley flour called sampa, sugar and tea. Mainly they ate sampa because it can be mixed with water and eaten without further cooking. At this altitude, water boils before it's hot enough to cook. They crossed three passes on the way to Dolpo, all close on 18,000 feet and were frequently only just below the snow line. At least once a day when they stopped to rest, the yaks had to be unloaded and turned loose to find what grazing they could. In Tukshe, and again in Marfa, the Heimendorfs had been warned against roaming bands of Tibetan refugees who'd turned to banditry. Now below them there was a camp, almost certainly a Tibetan camp. There was no way of avoiding it, and in any case, it was the first sign of human habitation they'd seen for many days. But as they approached, they couldn't help remembering the gruesome stories they'd been told of caravans massacred and travellers robbed of all they possessed. These were Tibetans. But they weren't bandits. They were peaceful herdsmen who'd fled from the Chinese and were only too anxious to be friendly. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Here in exile, their life was even harsher than in their native Tibet. Many of them were suffering severely from rheumatism and came to ask for medicines. Others complained of stomachache, headaches or toothache. But more than anything, they wanted to talk, to tell someone about their problems, about the difficulties of finding pastures for their sheep and yaks, about whether or not they should return to Tibet and what would happen to them if they did. From the Tibetans, the Heimendorfs learnt that they were on the edge of the Dolpo region and only a day's journey from a Dolpo village which was called Charka. Charka is over 14,000 feet above sea level, which makes it one of the highest permanently inhabited villages in Asia. When the Heimendorfs arrived, the village council was sitting out in the open discussing grazing rights. The headman, it seemed, had permitted Tibetan refugees to graze their flocks on village land village troublemaker disputed his right to do this. The argument went to and fro as such arguments do, without any real conclusion being reached. The winter in Dolpo is so long and so cold that the people spend most of the short summer out of doors trying to warm themselves in the sun while they spin and card the coarse wool from their sheep and yak. Weaving is women's work, and married women in Dolpo wear headdresses made of brass. The Heimendorfs wanted to buy one, but couldn't, because a Dolpo woman must never take off her brass hat. These people of Dolpo are of Tibetan race and language. The life they lead is hard and almost medieval in pattern. Of necessity, they're largely self-sufficient, for the mountain ranges that separate their villages make neighbours a luxury. The Heimendorf spent a month in Dolpo. They'd have liked to stay longer, but they were getting short of supplies, and they wanted to get down to the valley before the late summer rain swelled the rivers, making them, for all practical purposes, impassable. The yak drivers, too, wanted to get home. They'd become very friendly on this journey, and they'd invited the Heimendorfs to stay with them in their village, where they promised them a warm welcome. When they did get to Lubra, the village was in an uproar and far too busy to welcome visitors. <laughs> a girl who'd already had several lovers had suddenly left her parents' house and got married without consulting anyone. Such unorthodox behaviour was a slight on her family, and the whole village was making the most of it. It seemed kinder to leave them and the Heimendorfs pushed on to the neighbouring valley of Muktinat, where a fair was in progress. Every autumn, thousands of pilgrims gather in the valley at the site of a famous Hindu shrine. Many of them come from distant villages, and friends who haven't met for a year meet again at the fair, wearing their big ceremonial hats. The underlying reason for the pilgrimage is the desire to obtain purification by bathing in the sacred waters of the Hindu shrine. Men, women and children, both Hindu and Buddhist, walk round the shrine and pass under each of the 108 spouts, allowing themselves to be drenched in the sacred water. The altitude is 12,000 feet, the water ice cold.
Apart from this severe test of endurance, there's nothing austere about the celebrations at Muktinat. Rakshi and rice beer are drunk in great quantities, and very few people stay sober for long. The horse race is one of the most popular events of the fair. It's not at all an organized race. Three or four riders start in a bunch just when they feel like it. There's no visible finishing post and no one seems to care who wins. But it does give a man who wants to sell his horse a chance to show off its paces and his own horsemanship. There were a number of falls, none serious, until one man fell heavily and lay very still as the spectators ran towards him. It looked as if he'd been badly hurt, but instead of carrying him quietly away on a stretcher, his friends bundled his unconscious body back into the saddle and led him away on his horse. Everyone else went back to the race. By far the most colourful and dramatic performances in this area of Buddhist culture are the great temple dances. eternal struggle between good and evil, enacted in symbolic gestures, understandable to the ordinary layman. The dancers' movements conform to an age-old pattern, and the crowd knows every phase of the story and watches the measured steps of the dignitaries or the fierce antics of the god of war with the enthusiasm reserved for old favourites. Watching the dance, one is transported back into an age when ritual performance and the theatre were still combined. The actors were priests who represented gods and spirits. Today, when monastic life has been destroyed in Tibet, it's only in the remote valleys of northern Nepal that these ancient rituals can still be observed in their original form. Sheltered behind the Himalayan ranges, their survival is assured just so long as rough mountain tracks remain the only means of communication and yak and mule the only means of transport. 